Hi everyone and welcome back to Minds and Machines with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. So today we'll be continuing our somewhat brief discussion of machine functionalism. What I thought I would do today is uh, just draw your attention uh, to some interesting things that Putnam says that if you stick with philosophy of mind you will probably hear a lot more about. More stuff to do with uh, Turing machines, multiple realizability and functionalism, identity theory, and the mind-body problem. So I'll explain all of that stuff uh, in today's lecture. First, what we're going to do is a quick bit of recap on the ideas we covered last time, the aforementioned ideas of functionalism and multiple realizability. And then I thought I would do something that I probably should have done last time, and that is draw your attention to some of the historical antecedents of functionalism, most of which we've read in this class. So that's what we will do today. So let's get started with a little bit of recap. Now remember, on functionalism, we understand what something is or, or what it does in terms of its function. That could be a whole system or parts of a system, right? So last time I gave you the example of a heart. What makes something count as a heart? It's not what it's made of, it's what it does. And that is, it recirculates blood. It pumps oxygenated blood throughout your body and it takes deoxygenated and uh, deoxygenated blood and pumps it to the lungs or if you're a fish to the gills. Um, so those are uh, that's a, like a functionalist understanding of a heart. It's what it does. Uh, similarly with minds. What is a mind? Well we understand minds in terms of what they do and according to for example the computational theory of mind where cognition is just computation, minds are computers, essentially Turing machines, uh, produced by nature, right? So we can say that uh, a mind is uh, something that thinks. Anything that thinks uh, is a mind or has a mind, right? Uh, but we can also talk about parts of that system. Uh, mental states, for example. Right? How do we define mental states? How do we understand mental states? We understand, you know, mental states like uh, believing that P or uh, desiring that Q. Uh, we understand those in terms of uh, their functional roles within the larger system of the mind. And we'll take a look at this today when we look at Putnam's example of uh, pain uh, being equivalent or not equivalent to having your C fibers firing, right? That's the classic example. So uh, what makes a thing what it is, if you're a functionalist, is what it does, not what it's made of, right? And that leads us to multiple realizability, and that is the idea that minds can be physically realized or implemented using different physical structures or with different kinds of stuff, right? I have a mind, uh, that's implemented with this meat machine in my head, my brain, right? But it's not out of the question that some other form of life out there in the universe with a vastly different physiology um, would have a mind that's implemented uh, in a very different way, maybe with um, a different kind of, uh, you know, a different kind of way of uh, being alive, silicon-based life form instead of carbon-based life form. Or even if you look at the brains of different creatures on Earth, they're all quite different from one another. Mammalian brains are different from one another. Mammalian brains are different than reptilian brains and amphibian brains and fish brains and bird brains, right? Uh, but they're all minds. Most of these creatures, we would all agree, have minds, right? So we can implement minds with different physical structures. Just like we can have a heart, uh, say, for example, an artificial heart made out of um, metal or something right? Uh, we can implement a heart uh, with uh, muscle tissue or with machinery, and we could have a mind with different kinds of natural machinery or perhaps with artificial computing machinery, right? So what are some antecedents of functionalism that might help you um, get your minds around this idea of a functional system or a formal system, you know, without actually diving into uh, formal systems in detail? Well, as I mentioned when we were covering Aristotle, Aristotle in De Anima anticipates a kind of uh, version of functionalism. He writes, for example, in Book 2, 
But since it is also a body of such and such a kind, namely having life, the body cannot be soul. The body is the subject or matter, not what is attributed to it. Hence the soul must be a substance in the sense of the form of a natural body having life potentiality within it. But substance is actuality, and thus the soul is the actuality of a body as above characterized. That's very wordy, but what is Aristotle saying here? Well, the soul, if you recall, is the form of a living body. The, f the soul for Aristotle is not some kind of ghost in the machine, to use Gilbert Ryle's uh, terminology. The soul for Aristotle is the function, all of the organization and function of a living body. You know, living things do certain things for Aristotle. The most basic things they do is grow and reproduce, right? And they consume nutrients. So we have a nutritive soul, right? That's the most basic function that all living beings have. And some living beings are a little bit more advanced and they have, um, you know, they, they have the capacity to feel things and move about or to think, to use their minds. So they have, uh, you know, more uh, advanced kinds of souls by virtue of the structure and organization and function of their organisms, right? I mean, think of plants, which Aristotle thought just had the nutritive soul. Uh, they just grow, reproduce, consume stuff. Uh, and they're not very complicated. But something with a sensitive soul needs to have a brain and a nervous system of some kind. Right? So its organism is more complicated and it's organized. You know, this is why, you know, this is kind of where the, the term organism comes from, an organized body that has certain functions in virtue of which we say it has life. And of course, uh, for Aristotle, the most, um, I guess, advanced kinds of beings, you know, those with logos, humans, they have the very complicated organisms, the very complicated brains and nervous systems, right? Even though Aristotle wasn't really that interested in the brain, um, you know, the, the key takeaway here is that Aristotle was kind of a functionalist with respect to what makes something alive. What is a living being? At the bare minimum, it has to be able to grow, consume, uh, nutriment, and reproduce. But it can get more complicated as we move up in terms of the complexity of the organism from, you know, organisms that just have nutritive souls to those with sensitive souls to those with both the nutritive and sensitive and rational souls. So that's one way that Aristotle anticipated functionalism. Thomas Hobbes also anticipates functionalism, as I noted when we uh, looked at the first few bits of Hobbes' Leviathan. For example, in the introduction, the very famous introductory, uh, introductory passage where Hobbes writes, Nature, the art whereby God hath made and governs the world, is by the art of man, as in many other things, so in this also imitated, that it can make an artificial animal. For seeing life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part within, why may we not say that all automata, engines that move themselves by springs and wheels as doth a watch, have an artificial life. So, yeah, the first time we looked at this, we looked at this primarily under the scope of mechanistic philosophy. And it is very mechanistic, but it's also kind of functionalist, right? What makes something alive? Well, for Hobbes, it's not a matter of having skin and bones and blood and, and all of that stuff that natural animals or human beings have, um, it could also include artificial machinery. If we made an artificial man, right, out of wheels and springs, we could say it's alive too. If it kind of went around and did things in the world the same way we did. Of course, that's not the kind of artificial man Hobbes is really talking about. Hobbes is actually talking about the state. The state is kind of like a living being for Hobbes. But it's this sort of functionalism with respect to life that allows him to make that comparison, right? But in chapter 5, it even, uh, even gets even more functionalist, right? He says, uh, quote, 
For reason, in this sense, is nothing but reckoning, that is, adding and subtracting, of the consequences of general names agreed upon for the marking and signifying of our thoughts. I say marking them when we reckon by ourselves, and signifying when we demonstrate or approve our reckoning to other men. So here Hobbes is talking specifically about the mind, and he's saying that reason is kind of like uh, calculating. But we're not calculating with numbers. We're calculating the consequences of names, propositions, sentences in which we express things. So again, here we're getting back to, you know, the kind of formal systems I mentioned earlier, like logic, right? Logical calculus uh, allows us to express things and determine the consequences of those expressions, right? It allows us to reason deductively. And these systems, if they are uh, sound and complete, will always allow us to enable, or always enable us to reason properly, right? And if the mind is like that, uh, then it doesn't really matter what symbols and words we use. What matters is the role they play within the system. What does this string of symbols say? What does this signifier mean? Does it mean and? Does it mean or? Does it mean not? Right? So we're seeing a little bit of uh, a little bit more of this anticipation of functionalism in Hobbes here in chapter five of the Leviathan. Now, this is not mentioned in the uh, optional reading, the Stanford Encyclopedia article on uh, functionalism uh, that I linked you to. But I think Lemaitre also sounds a little bit like a functionalist. He does say, after all, on page 109 of Man and Machine, that man's preeminent advantage is his organism, right? Remember, Lemaitre is putting humans and non-human animals in the same class of uh, beings, right? We're all animals. It's, uh, it, you know, it, it's not that we're superior in, t you know, in the sense that we're on top of animals in some kind of great chain of being, and then there's angels above us and God at the top, right? No, Lemaitre says that um, we are all machines, non-human animals and human beings. We are all kinds of machines, and we each, all of us, have souls. And if humans are superior in some ways to animals, that's because of the structure and organization of their bodies, right? But the flip side is also true. If animals are superior in some ways to us, say if, a, you know, like lions are stronger and faster than people, but we're smarter than lions and we can um, sharpen spears and uh, defend ourselves from lions, right? If you're looking for like a Pleistocene era example, um, you know, if animals are superior in that way, that's because of the advantages of their organisms, right? So Lemaitre is kind of a bit of a functionalist too. Uh, we have the capabilities that we do, you know, reason for humans, strength and speed for animals, because of the way our bodies are put together. So that's kind of a, a little functionalist e to me anyway. All right, so let's take a closer look at machine functionalism, just a little bit, you know, in the interest of getting caught up here, because really I think the key takeaway uh, the key takeaway here is the idea that what matters is what something does, not what it's made of, right? The functionalism, multiple realizability sort of uh, tag team understanding kind of thing. Uh, so we'll try to be quick about this, but I just want to re reiterate a couple of the things I've said about formal or functional systems. Formal systems include things like logical calculus, mathematics, stuff like that. Functional systems include minds, if you're a functionalist. A Turing machine is either or. Turing formalized computation with Turing machines, and what that means is he gave us a way to talk about computation where, you know, we could derive proofs about what computers can and can't do, right? That's why we say Turing formula, formalized computation. Let's take a formal system, just for example. If you have a formal system that's sound and complete, like, for example, the predicate calculus in logic. The predicate calculus is um, uh, something that allows you to uh, say things about 
uh, different entities uh, in a kind of logical language, right? Uh, we, can, we can talk about objects or beings and their properties using these kinds of logical calculi, right? But we don't write them down in natural language. We write them down with different symbols, and the symbols mean different things, right? So I, instead of writing Josh is tall, I could write uh, J is T, right? And that, that's like a little logical thing that says Josh has the property of being tall. Um, or I can do it with the predicate calculus and use the existential quantifier and say there exists an X and X is tall and I'm the X, right? So um, the point is we can create expressions about things. We can derive proofs. We can reason, right? You can, you can, um, you know, uh, you can use these logical calculi to, to reason properly. That is what reason, uh, and well, that is what logic is. It's the study of proper reasoning. And as I said earlier, the symbols in any formal system or the functional states in any um, functional system, uh, what, they, what they actually are is kind of arbitrary. Because what Putnam is saying here is the physical realization is not important. What is important are formal or functional relations between all the parts of the system. So in a formal system, these symbols, like, you know, P, Q, and, or, all these symbols we could use in our logical language, these symbols are physical patterns, right? Think back to my lecture on what is the mind. Symbols are physical patterns. Uh, as per the physical symbol system hypothesis. The states of uh, a functional system will be realized in some kind of physical medium, but it doesn't matter what, right? I can use any symbols I want. I can use P, Q, and, or, or I could make up my own symbols as long as I follow the rules when I'm using them. Similar with, uh, you know, a functional system. What matters is what it does, not what it's made of, because multiple realizability. So, um, all this is to say what matters is uh, what symbols mean and the rules according to which we can manipulate them. What matters is what the functional states are doing in a functional system, not how they are physically realized. It matters how all these are related to the other parts of the system, but it does not really matter what it's made out of. That's kind of arbitrary, right? I can have a pocket calculator that uses, uh, you know, digital uh, silicon chips and uh, number crunching and logic gates, or I can have an abacus. They're both calculators, right? And just to reiterate, a key takeaway here, why this is all called machine functionalism is because in section two, Putnam spends a lot of time talking about Turing machines and trying to establish that the mind is like a Turing machine. And remember, Turing machines are imaginary, but they have uh, parts, right? Turing machines are functional systems, by the way, uh, formal systems and functional systems. That's what allowed Turing to derive proofs about properties of Turing machines, because he formalized computation using the notion of a Turing machine. So a machine, if you, a Turing machine, remember, is a discrete state machine. It can be in a number of uh, different states, many, many different states, but it's only in one state at a time. And of course, these states are logical or functional states. But we can physically realize a Turing uh, machine uh, in many different ways, right? Uh, recall the calculator example once again. I can have a digital pocket calculator or I can have an abacus. I can have a digital computer. Uh, made of uh, silicon chips and wires, or I could have a digital computer that runs on gears and wheels and punch cards, a bit like uh, Babbage's analytical engine, which, had he made it, actually built it, would have been the first computer. And I could implement um, the same program on these different machines that are realized differently, right? I could implement 2 plus 2 equals 4 on a pocket calculator, just like I can on an abacus. So there you go. Now, of course, Putnam is saying we can do the same thing with human minds, right? Uh, human mental states or psychological states correspond to the logical states, that is the uh, formal or functional states of Turing machines. 
the physiological states of the brain, you know, what, what neurons are firing and so on, would correspond to the physical states of the Turing machine. Where's the tape at? What symbols are on the tape? What's the machine head doing? so on and so forth. So that is the comparison that Putnam is making here. Mental states of humans are like logical states in a Turing machine. Physiological states of human brains are like physical states of the Turing machine. And because of multiple realizability, well, how things are implemented doesn't really matter. What matters are these formal logical relations between all the different states of the machine. You know, this is where we kind of get to this famous uh, C-fibers firing example, right? Uh, C-fibers, by the way, are a type of uh, nerve cell, a type of neuron, right? And they fire when humans experience pain. So, you know, if I uh, put you in a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine and I look at your brain in real time and I, you know, maybe I poke you or something while you're in there, uh, such that you feel pain, uh, your C-fibers are going to fire, right? So, C-fibers are a real thing. This isn't just some made-up uh, example. They're an actual type of nerve that we have in the human nervous system. And this is all related to, to um, a lot of Putnam's uh, discussion at the beginning of this paper where he's talking about... Um, uh, problems with mind-brain identity, right? And he's, he's trying to draw attention to the fact that a lot of these problems are really just linguistic, and they're not real problems. Some might argue, uh, some dualists um, uh, would, might argue that uh, statements like, Josh is in pain, and statements like, Josh's C-fibers are firing, say two different things. So they can't be about uh, the same thing, right? The proposition Josh is in pain uh, and Josh's C-fibers are firing are not the same. They're not, uh, they're not like a, uh, they're not identical, right? So they can't be the same thing, right? But Putnam is saying like, look, this doesn't really matter. The, sure, sure, grant that this is a problem and, and uh, you know, these sentences don't express the same thing. Uh, it doesn't really matter, because what matters, again, are logical or functional relations within the system. Why? Well, of course, it's because multiple realizability is something that we have to take into consideration. There could be aliens. Again, I, I know, I, why do I keep using this aliens example? I guess I like aliens. Uh, I watch a lot of science fiction. Ah, oh, what am I doing? I mean, look, there could be aliens, right? I know I keep talking about aliens, but use our imaginations and imagine that there are some aliens out there with a very different physiology. They don't even have C fibers, right? They're silicon based and maybe they have some kind of like weird silicon based brain. So they don't have C fibers. They have something that they call uh, Zorp matrices or something that, that fire when they're in pain, right? Would we deny you know, if we, if we turned the tables on these aliens and instead of probing us, we probed them, if one of them cried out, ouch, when we did this, would we deny that they experience pain because there are no C fibers firing in their alien brains? Well, no, I don't think we would. I don't think the aliens would say, ouch. I think they, they might have their own unique way to express pain, obviously. Uh, but the point is uh, that there are different ways we can realize the mental state of being in pain. Um, it could be C-fibers or it could be whatever I said the aliens have. The state of being in pain is defined in terms of its functional relations to other states, like when you're not in pain or when you cry out, ouch, uh, something like that, right? So the physical realization is uh, not as important as the logical relations between these states within the system or the functional relations of the states within the system. So. And why is Putnam using this example? Well, Putnam is pointing out some problems with um, a, type of, uh, a type of physicalism called uh, identity theory or a type physicalism, actually, not to be confusing. So according to identity theory or type physicalism, uh, mental states are brain states, right? Identity theory, there's a few different kinds, but what identity theory, uh, all the different variations have in common is that they identify mental states with brain states. 
So with, um, with type physicalism, what you do is you identify mental states with a type of brain state. So to go back to the example of pain, um, mental state, you know, being in pain is a type of mental state that just is a type of brain state, namely a brain state when your C fibers are stimulated, right? Um, we can contrast this with something called token identity theory. Um, uh, the thing is, there, not, there might not be stable, steady categories of uh, brain states, right? Because my brain is different than your brain. So even if pain is your C fibers firing, my C fibers are going to fire different than yours, right? So with token identity theory, a mental state is a token of a type of a mental state. So it's not that there's one universal type of mental state where everyone's C fibers fire the same way. It's a token of a type. So my C fibers fire in such and such a way and yours fire in a different way. So a good way to understand uh, token identity theory or token type identity theory is that specific mental states are linked to specific brain events, not types of brain events, right? So my specific mental state of being in pain is my specific pattern of C fiber stimulation, which will be different from yours because you have a differently wired brain, right? So we're not dealing with types, we're dealing with tokens. Types and tokens, by the way, you can think about in terms of particulars and universals, if you like. Um, it's kind of like, uh, well, let's use my guitar. Like uh, this is a, this is an Ibanez Gem Junior. This is a type of electric guitar. But this particular one is a token of that type. There are many different uh, tokens of this type. Some of them are different colors, uh, sitting at the music store right now, or in someone else's um, bedroom or something, right? These are all different tokens of the same type. Now, functionalism and multiple realizability help us avoid the problems of uh, type physicalism, right? As I said a moment ago, there may not be these steady, stable categories of brain states because all our brains are a little bit different from one another. And of course, if we look at other mammals or indeed other kinds of life like reptiles or fish or aliens, their brains are different too. So functionalism and multiple realizability help us avoid these worries that we get with um, type physicalism. Real quick, what does Putnam say about the mind-body problem? We've got to talk about the mind-body problem because it's such a big problem, isn't it? Well, actually, no. Uh, Putnam does not think the mind-body problem is a serious philosophical problem. It, 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 no solution to this problem, he says, would have the slightest effect on any of our lives, right? And why is that? Well, again, it goes back to this functionalist view of the mind that he presents. Uh, it doesn't really matter what something is made of. A mind is, is not just a, a physical state. You know, we're not identity theorists, but the mind also isn't some kind of ghost in the machine, right? We're not dualist, dualists. The mind, kind of like what Aristotle said all the way back in the day, uh, your, your rational soul, your mind, your soul is something you have in virtue of the organization and functions of your body, namely your brain and your nervous system, right? So what are some implications of this when it comes to the mind-body problem? Well, Putnam says toward the end of the paper, if you equate the mind-body problem, you know, how do the mind and body interact or how do the soul and the body interact, I suppose, uh, with the question, do we have souls, then you've got just a few different options. Um, you can say that no argument ever, that any philosopher has ever made, ever, ever sheds light on this question. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a non-problem, right? And uh, it's, it's maybe a linguistic problem, right? Uh, that's kind of where uh, Putnam's discussion is uh, oriented in the beginning of the paper, that this is all just really a problem with the way we talk about things. Um, or that some argument for mechanistic philosophy must be correct. And we've looked at many such arguments in this class. Or humans and machines both must have souls. If the, if the mind is the soul and the mind is, 
you know, something that arises out of the structure and function of uh, some organism's uh, body, you know, their brain or whatever, then, um, yeah, we can implement that in a machine. What's the problem? So like Lemaitre says, uh, you know, uh, animals and humans are machines with souls. And here's Putnam saying, well, machines like a Turing machines or computers or robots and human beings have souls. So that's functionalism and multiple realizability. <sighs> okay, everyone, I know we've gone through that one really quick. Again, the key takeaways are functionalism and multiple realizability. I didn't want to talk too much about formal systems because that's a whole rabbit hole. Um, uh, I feel like I'd have to spend a couple lectures talking about logic to really get you up to speed on that stuff. So if anyone has any questions, um, you know, go ahead and talk to me. Uh, but for now, you know, just remember that the important takeaways are what machine functionalism is. You know, we understand something in terms of logical or functional relations or formal relations, not physical realization. And make sure you understand what multiple realizability is. That's the idea that we can implement these systems using different physical stuff, right? Okay, so next time what we're going to do is come back to the Turing test and we're going to start asking whether machines can pass the Turing test. We didn't really talk about this when we uh, talked about the Turing test in very much detail. So for next time we're going to take a look at Wiesenbaum's paper. Uh, Wiesenbaum, Joseph Wiesenbaum was the inventor of ELIZA, one of the first chatbot programs. So remember how I said that we can look at Turing's test as either an empirical experiment or a thought experiment? Well, next time, we're going to consider it as kind of an empirical experiment and very briefly explore whether a chatbot like Eliza passes the Turing test. Eliza, Eliza. I'm actually not sure which, which it is. After that, our second lecture on passing the Turing test will go theoretical again and we'll look at it as a thought experiment. We'll do that by taking a look at another thought experiment, John Searle's Chinese Room Thought Experiment. So that's what we'll be doing for the next two lectures. They will, of course, be a little shorter than usual in the interest of catching up. And by the way, everyone, the special topics poll is now available. So if you're one of my students, go on See You Learn, choose your preferred topic and cast your vote. I've narrowed everything down to about five choices, and I will lecture on the two choices that get the most votes. So please go and vote by the end of the week. And if you have any questions about that or about any of the other course material, please let me know in the meantime. Otherwise, I'll see you all very soon for our next lecture, where we'll talk about whether Eliza or Eliza can pass the Turing test. Until then, take care, and I'll see you all next time. Bye for now.